everybody, and welcome, uh, Paul. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, just as sort of a, a brief introduction, uh, Paul uh, works with the state um, STS, which is Strategic Technology. Strategic Technology, yeah. Uh, and it's within uh, Department of Finance, which is, it's, we don't think about the geospatial world being in finance, but you'll actually find a lot of different uh, states. That's where they put us. I think maybe it's because they don't know where else to put us, so that's where we end up. Um, but Paul's also one of our graduates from our department, and since none of you all had a chance to go to meetings like the AAG and TINGIT, we're asking folks to come in virtually and share sort of their experiences um, in their professional life being professional geographers. And uh, so we appreciate Paul coming in and kicking this thing off for us. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Yeah, man. So tell us a little bit about your time in the department. Um, what you were working on while you were here, and then if there were any sorts of um, experiences or opportunities that you took advantage of, because one of the things I'm really harping on our undergrads to do is, you know, undergrad research, finding those internships, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on the call, I was really focused or trying to focus more on the technical and physical geography aspects. Um, I was kind of perturbed and annoyed that we were only getting or only had the option to get a BA and I hear that that's right there's the potential to get a BS which would be really nice it hasn't affected anything in my work career um, but I was just you know as a student I was concerned about that um, but yeah so focused less on the cultural geography aspects uh, really enjoyed uh, we're just talking about Dr. G's classes for cultural geography. She did geography at Tennessee. I think she's at um, Western Kentucky now. Um, anyway, remote sensing, GPS, GIS, cartography, those were probably my favorite core courses. Um, and then as far as taking advantage of opportunities, I can't say I did a really good job and I kick myself about it. And also I'm enthused to hear about how many opportunities that you guys are offering now that I don't feel like I had like the push to join Tinjik, let's say, or uh, Eurissa. I didn't have the push or, or the felt like I needed to do those things. And uh, I kind of wish that I had because later in my career, I got involved in it and, and it helped out. Um, you know, tremendously. So, I, I, to, to short answer, I didn't do much. And you've been successful, wildly successful. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, it just goes to show that just because I recommend something, it's my personal recommendations. It comes from my personal anecdotes. Uh, so, you know, uh, take everything I say with a very, very hefty grain of salt. So, um, Paul, you graduated in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, not long after that was the start of the Great Recession. So what was your transition yep. like from being an undergrad to work? Where was that uh, first job that you landed? Can sure. You walk us through that. Yep. So after graduation, I actually spent my last semester abroad in the UK, um, which was awesome because it was kind of like a vacation. I already had my my core classes kind of out of the way. And so I decided to study abroad um, and then, and, and that was a great opportunity if you can take advantage of any of that, you know, being in Prague, that was awesome, right? Like travel around Europe, it's, it's so fun uh, at that age. Um, and then came back uh, and got a job with a local surveying firm that kind of family friends. So I, I was able to get an, an easy job there. Then took uh, about six months off and went to Hawaii and lived for six months. My, 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 my career there, like it's probably not the norm, right? People take a year off kind of stuff, but I just saved up a bunch of money. I was like, screw it. I'm going to, you know, Hawaii, live for six months, came back and decided I needed to join the real world in quotes, real world. Um, and got a job with wiser company, um, doing basically digitizing, doing as entry level GIS analyst work. Um, and really in, enjoyed that there. And the, the recession did play a little bit of part in that as far as I've, I've had a period of time when I came back from Hawaii where 
I had to go back into landscaping and that kind of stuff where I couldn't find a GIS job. It, I was just waiting for that opportunity and I really, really it was kind of difficult at that time to, to find one, um, but I was lucky. So, so um, if I remember right, wiser has got an office sort of, at, it's either in Nashville or Murfreesboro, right? In Murfreesboro, yeah. Okay, and um, if you keep an eye on the Indeed website, they still, um, until very recently, I've, I've seen jobs from Wiser uh, on Indeed, and they're usually looking for folks um, that can work on, a lot of times it's things related to intelligence. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so they're still around if that's something you all are interested in. So uh, after- It's you great were intro experience. Just, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. We can talk more about that if we want to. Yeah, anybody got questions on that so far? Nope, doesn't look like it. <laughs> Nathan turning over a piece of paper. That's what it popped up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you were with Wiser for a while. How long were yep. you there? Seven years, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I worked my way from a uh, geospatial analyst, kind of that digitizing, then to a technical lead and then to a team lead production slash production manager, um, all on the defense side. So it is geo and in, in intelligence. Um, but yeah, most mostly digitizing work. I don't know what they're working on now, um, but it was great experience for me at the time. And um, yeah, then I moved on to STS. So with Wiser, did you have to go through the um, security clearance process? Yep. Okay. Yep. And Kurt talks about that now in his 499 class. So that's good. Um, and can you sort of just talk to us a little about when you say production work, what does that mean? Sure. Yeah. Production, like data production, right? So you're either taking um, imagery and collecting things from that, or uh, you're conflating data together. So you're bringing data sets from multiple things to produce a, uh, a, a product, right? The data being the product. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. So seven years with uh, Wiser, and then at some point you made this switch to STS. So how did that work out? Um, so basically, and just just kind of a heads up as far as the defense industry and the engineering industry and private sector in general, right? A lot of it can be contract based, so it's up and down as far as money goes and and people and. Um, you know, it's just, that's just how it works, right? You have to get a contract if you work for an engineering firm to uh, to work, right? To get money. Um, and so a lot of that up and down um, made me pretty stressed out. And so I was looking for something a little bit more stable, um, something where I could help folks. I really in, like found that I enjoyed that um, most about STS and, and just started kind of looking around. I wasn't in any like immediate need for a job at that time, but it was just like one of those things I gave myself enough stress and was taking work home and that kind of stuff that I didn't want to mess with it anymore. So I just started looking and then, yeah, luck would have it. I, I found a job uh, at STS. Um, I did go to a, a ten, middle Tengic meeting and got to meet some of the folks that were working on the team. Um, so that was very important. Um, but yeah, that's that kind of led me to where I am now. So is that your first interaction uh, with Tenjik at that point? Uh, yeah, so uh, another kind of oddity with me, my, my dad uh, was a local planning and zoning guy for Franklin County. Um, and he was like going to Tenjik meetings ages before, like, you know, you should, you should check out GIS because he knew I was going into geography and geology. Those are both my my kind of focuses and uh yeah you should check out gis okay all right well sure dad uh-huh yeah and then like later on down the line he's like oh well you should go talk to dennis peterson he's the man in GIS. you know and so it's like okay well i'll go talk to dennis and that kind of stuff and meet meet folks and uh yeah i don't know if that answered the question i'll just kind of like run around with it oh, so that's great a little bit. Tell, tell us about dennis peterson sure yeah so dennis peterson is yeah for those that don't know he's a basically the GIS director or GIS coordinator for the state of Tennessee. So he's the director for our, our group. And our group is in, you know, it's in finance and administration, but we're kind of the con consolidated IT group for the state of Tennessee. That's that best describes us. And we're going to get to Dennis's role with the LIDAR here in a minute. But sure. um, before we get into that, what other things were you working on 
if anything, because I don't know exactly when the planning for the statewide LIDAR acquisition started. So what other things were you working on besides the LIDAR project? Uh, I work typically, uh, there's, there are three main focuses for me, and that's uh, imagery, parcel data, and, and LIDAR. Um, basically, our group is, it, it, we take data from other state agencies and then serve it out either to the public or to emergency communications districts or to um, other state agencies. So I get parcel data from the comptroller of the treasury, and then I put it out there on the property viewer. That's one of my main tasks right now. Um, I also take uh, imagery from TDOT's flights, or we're in the process of uh, removing the Google imagery product from our, our services. But basically, that's just for state agencies and uh, emergency communications districts, and we're replacing that. So I've, I'm you know, working through that with uh, with the vendor, basically. So, all right, we're going to get to planning and budget stuff here in a little bit. Um, but go ahead and tell us a little bit about the um, the statewide lidar project, sort of how that came about, um, and that sort of the, the workflow and the process for that. Okay. Um, yeah. The the very first parts of the lidar project, I wasn't actually at the state yet. Um, they had just started uh, and received a pilot project, I believe, in 2012, 2013. And then that kind of morphed into uh, collecting a, a large scale 27 county project that covered the, all, the entire Cumberland Plateau. Um, and so at that point, I moved into a role where I was focusing on the LIDAR project as well as my current other current tasks. And uh, yeah, the, the LIDAR basically was like, we've got all this data and it's coming in. We need to figure out how we need to serve it. You know, it's it a really big thing for Dennis to be talking about, you know, at Tinjik, uh, for instance, or the GIS community as a whole, whether it's in state agencies, it's just got so many uses. And, and so we needed to come up with communication plans, like all the things that need to figure out when you have that much data and you're trying to share it. Um, and then my involvement from there grew into you know, doing quality control uh, on that project uh, then to uh, well we have all this data now and how do we empower the users or how do we figure out how the state state folks around the state can you know actually use it right you got all this data people just don't know as far as uh, information wise you know like oh I heard it can do that well okay let me show you how it can do that or how do you how do you get that person you know to to start accessing it, start putting it to use. So in your experience so far, what are the products that most people need from that data set that you've got? Contours, for sure. Um, contours and the elevation models. Uh, those are probably, you know, most people come into it and think that they may want the point cloud, but they don't necessarily need the point cloud. They don't, they don't need it for their workflow. So it's a lot of the derivatives that we've seen the largest use case in really. All right, I'm gonna be really mean. I'm gonna put Kelly and Adriana on the spot for a minute. So uh, you all knew this was coming. So uh, go ahead, if one of you or both of you, unmute yourselves and uh, tell Paul a little bit about the project that you all did for your undergrad research. <laughs> okay, fine Kelly, sure. Uh, we used basically the LIDAR point cloud for Knox County and we went in and identified lower income block groups and we used the LIDAR to analyze the roofs in uh, those low income block groups to see which ones would be uh, compatible with um, solar panel installation for basically just in like installing solar panels um, in low-income houses uh, just for energy poverty alleviation. And so were you all using the derivative products or were you all using the original point clouds? Um, I think we just used the point cloud, yeah. If you're doing roof stuff, top stuff, you probably need need the point cloud. Yeah. And y'all did a fantastic job at the Tinjit conference too. I remember talking to both of you <laughs> afterwards. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Nicely done. Yeah, so they, they presented that at uh, Tinjik and they presented it at the undergraduate uh, 
research symposium. And if I remember right, um, didn't you all get a big award through Eureka for that? Yeah, uh, we got like the award of excellence for social science and the silver award for the whole thing. Sweet. Nicely done. And then Nick, Using have you... Kennedy data. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, were you working with Sam Moffat at the Esri conference last year to give the talk on the use cases in Tennessee? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Yep. Do you want me to talk about that? Or... Yeah, if you want to. No, I mean, I'd just whatever you want to, however you want it to roll. Um, that was just uh, basically trying to get how we're present on how we as tennis, you know, as Tennessee, how we're supporting the users. Like I said, how we're in empower without lack of a better term, the users that, you know, don't know about the LIDAR data, what, can, what it can do. Obviously we're using Esri products a lot. Um, so part of that was, you know, in, involved in that, so. All right. Yep. Um, so, Let's let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about. Tangier. Hang on, Mike. Before we oh. move on, I want to say something about one probably the most one of the most valuable things I think Paul's done is all the training partnership with Tinjik to actually go out into the user communities and train people. You're kind of breaking up on the audio. Maybe that's just me. No, um, so you're just talking about the, the training that you've been doing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So at, at this point, we have mm -hmm. trained, uh, I say we, I have trained 400 something plus folks, we being Tinjik, right? So Tinjik foots the bill for me and the state of Tennessee foots the bill for me to go and train, I don't know, somebody from Blunt County or from Kingsport or, you know, and they could be you know, a city engineer, or they could be a state agency user, they could be a student. I've had tons of students in our in the classes. Um, and so basically had to develop a training course um, on how to to use the data, how to put it to use, how to just introductory level put it to use. Um, and I've taught that, you know, at UTK, I've taught that at ETSU, um, all, all across the state. And now that's, that's actually morphed into me doing video recordings. So now that's available online on our website to um, state agency users, to the public, you know, this data is out here. Here's how you can start putting it to use. Um, Esri's put it up on their website, which I was pretty shocked that they didn't want to edit it a whole bunch. <laughs> they, they just took it and, and put it on, you know, links to it, um, which is super cool and, and kind of flattering, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that, that's kind of the, the, the training program for sure is what I'm most known about around the state um, because just because I've been, you know, going around and talking to folks and teaching them, but it's All been right. really, really enjoyable. And I've, I didn't think, you know, you asked me a few years ago, whether, where I would be or what I would be doing. And I didn't think I would be traveling around the state and teaching people how to use LIDAR data, <laughs> but I've really enjoyed it. And so you, you've mentioned Tenjik, they've come up a couple of times. Um, you're currently running for the, the board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, so you obviously see some value in the organization. Can you just let our undergrads know a little bit about what you get out of being part of that? Sure, yeah. And uh, I can preface it by saying, again, I did not do much as an undergrad and I didn't do much while I was working uh, my, in my early in my early career to be involved in the GIS community in Tennessee. And once I started getting involved, I can't, I mean, it, it just improved uh, my networking, right? They always say networking, that's such a big, you know, it, it is, right? Like it's great to know people for a number of reasons um, to have a contact to say, hey, do you know much about this company or this person or do you know anything about this data, right? I mean, it's just, there are so many different things that you can gain from the networking aspect, um, but also you get to, uh, to learn about how people are using data or how they're doing, uh, how they have their GIS set up, how they, you know, how they're doing their work. Um, which is extremely valuable and I think increases your knowledge. Um, and you can also in turn, you know, kind of 
do the same, right? You can tell people what you're doing and, and learn how to maybe make your workflow more efficient or help yourself find a job in the future or, you know, there's just so many, so many benefits. And I think the biggest thing as an undergrad that I would maybe recommend or take, like make yourself impressionable by um, not necessarily like walking up to me at a conference or Dennis at a conference or somebody at a conference is just introducing yourself. That certainly helps, but getting involved, put your face like, not only do you just you know, like somebody that comes up and introduces themselves to me one time at a conference I may remember them but if I worked with them on the outreach and education committee right like I'm definitely going to remember oh hey Mike and I worked on whatever this committee or worked on this project or um, I just think getting involved like really um, you know that that takes it to the next level and you even remembered their solar lidar project yeah absolutely yeah. Very cool. Um, Kurt, anything else you want to chime in with right at the moment? No. All right. Um, so if I understand right, Paul, you've got a, your bachelor's, but you don't have any sort of advanced degree. Is that right? Correct. Is, yep. You had any plans for that going forward? Uh, I've researched it a little bit off and on, and I uh, don't think I'm going to pursue it at this at this point. Just not one of those things that I'm interested in i guess there's some benefits with the state that i can go back and get probably my master's but it, it would take i have to be biting little chunks off here and there and i value my personal time way too much i like playing in my shop or in the yard on the gotcha farm. so let me let's sort of maybe uh turn this around just a little bit um so obviously the coronavirus is having huge impacts on folks um and one of those big impacts is uh, the financial impact on local, state, and federal agencies, most likely, but definitely at the, the local and the state level. Uh, how is that impacting? Is it impacting your budget? Is it, is it impacting who or if you're hiring? Is it impacting what kind of projects you're doing? Um, mostly the projects that I'm doing because I don't have the direct hands-on as far as budget and the, um, you know, that other stuff that's just you know the, but the projects yes so uh currently uh suzanne white on our team she works with stsgis she handles the special projects and she's been coordinating with health and i've been helping her update uh data for a dashboard uh basically to be feeding uh folks state agency users uh and then now it's going to be put on the their uh, the governor's website or whatever. So that's definitely taken a chunk as far as time goes and, and investment, um, you know, and for that to take away from my other projects and things like that. Um, so it's definitely affected me there. I have to work on, you know, now on the weekends, we got to update as soon as the, as soon as the health data hits the website and, and hits our, um, start, like right after this, I'm probably going to update the, the data. So. Spoiler alert, Trousdale County goes up by 800 today. <laughs> yeah. oh, what's that about? Uh, prison. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, what are you using on the, is, are you guys just updating arrest service? Um, so, what, yeah, what we have basically is ArcGIS Online is what's feeding dashboard as your products, right? Um, so, uh, getting a, a CSV from the health department and then taking that and publishing it to ArcGIS Online, and then it's feeding the dashboard. Okay. All right, I got one more for you, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Kurt and the undergrads that are here with us. Um, so you've, you've been doing the GIS thing for several years now. Um, you, you started with the, the digitizing, sort of at the technician analyst role, and you, you right. definitely worked your way up. Um, if you were in charge of hiring some folks, especially, either um, interns or new grads, what are the things that you're looking for or would you be looking for in that scenario? Um, sure, and, and it all depends on, right, for, for STS GIS, right? We're, we're in a, there's so many little niches, right, in GIS, um, but for, so for us, I would say that it would be somebody with a little bit of programming experience. So a little bit of Python where you'd be able to at least look at it and tell you what it's doing. 
I'm not the best at it. I, I, I'm not a programmer. We have programmers on our staff, but it definitely helps a little bit. Um, I would say just being overall well-rounded to know, you know, how a GIS is set up, how it works, you know, data sharing to a user. Uh, most folks are Esri, um, you know, Esri shops. So definitely having the ArcGIS Online experience, being able to set up a quick dashboard or a story map or um, something like that, I think could definitely help. Um, but well-rounded with clear and concise communication, I think those go really, really, really far. So if I was interviewing somebody, that's what, it, what I'd be looking for. I heard someone recently say, um, hire for attitude because we can teach you the skills. Sure. Yeah, yeah, if you have a basic knowledge of how to solve simple problems, simple GIS problems, you may not, you know, like, you may not want to tackle this, you know, serving out millions and millions of, you know, gigs of data out to whatever on the first day, you're not going to, you're going to have to learn your, you know, work your way up. So just being able to solve simple problems and then, uh, yeah, clear and concise communication, which I'm still working on to this day. I'm, I'm good about like providing a humongous paragraph and then being like, oh, this really only needed to be one line or like three bullet points and the people will get what you, you know, like that. And, and I do the same when I read somebody, you know, it's like, why did you write this paragraph? <laughs> Yeah, I'm guilty of that. I'm, I'm always like, oh, they probably want some context for this. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> let yeah. me give you the backstory. Yeah. Well, uh, Kurt and Nathan, let me turn it over to you guys if you've got uh, any other questions or comments for Paul. Kurt, you're muted. Uh, who was it? You work for where? Is that, was that the name of the company? Wiser. 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 Yep. Did you work in a skiff? Uh, we had a skiff, and I did not have to work in the skiff per se. Okay. All right. The the reason I ask, I, I got an opportunity to work in a skiff at Integraph, and it's a horrid environment, so I don't recommend it. And that I think it's secure, compartmentalized, institutional facility or something, but yep. it's a, it's it's behind the curtain, no windows, things like that. Yeah. For a minute, I thought you meant a small boat. No, I would rather work in a small boat. Makes more sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's 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 all I got. All right, Nathan. Anything from you? No. No. All right. All right, Nick, Kelly, and Adriana. Uh, Y'all got anything else to to ask Paul about today? Um. Yeah, I guess a quick question. Um, and it has to do with sensitive information. Like, I, I don't know if with the like COVID data that you're working with any of the like tables or attributes have contained sensitive information, but like, are, are you or in the past, have you worked with sensitive information? And like, how have you, I guess, managed that of like showing or, or completing projects that you have to complete without, you know, revealing any information that shouldn't be revealed or at least shouldn't be revealed to a wider audience sure yeah i have i have actually haven't had to uh work with very much sensitive information as far as the health data is concerned most of that is filtered before it gets to us so we don't have to worry about it right they're super sensitive like to get a a connection to their one of their databases their databases have lots of personal information in them so we typically don't you know, like, unless you have a specific need for a specific project, um, you know, it's just not, not something that's just typically, typically shared just in my position. So yeah, if that answers the question. And Paul, is there anything else that we should have asked you about today or do you just uh, want to share with us that we didn't talk about? Hey, Mike, young Ken uh, had a question. Um, check the chat. Oh, here. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Ah, okay. So Dr. Kim, thank you, Kurt. Appreciate that. Would like to know if uh, STS has any internship opportunities for undergrads. That would be a question for Dennis. And at this time, I'm not aware of any. I'm pretty sure that they've had internship opportunities in the past but it's been a while it's been over five plus six plus years since i've been with sts um but 
they I think they happen based on what I've what I've heard Chris and and my direct supervisor Chris Meeks and Dennis talk about. All right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't, as far as any additional things, uh, I would say maybe like two tips, I don't know, two tips that I could think about. Like when you asked me to do this, I was like, what did I wish I knew? Like as an undergrad, <laughs> you know, going into the work, like, you know, the scary world, right? Um, the first one I would say is it never hurts to ask for more money. When you are in a job interview, always 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 and i've been in the position in hiring and you know you've got a little egg you know you're going to offer somebody x amount of dollars there's always a little bit of extra and if there's not then they'll just tell you no and then you can accept the job um so i would say that i was always afraid to do that when i was first coming into the or i was always afraid i was afraid of that when i first came into the job market and looking i was like first gis job sweet yes i'll take it you know, instead of saying, well, like I was really looking, you know, for an extra 5% based on my budget or whatever the case is. And, you know, they may make it work out and make your life just a little bit easier because money, you know, I mean, we, we work for money. So, uh, the other thing would be that communication is key. Um, I think, you know, you don't have to necessarily be an extrovert to, to get involved in Tinjik, for instance, or network or anything like that, but just clear communication and communication skills go a long way. Um, you know, whether, again, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to go get involved in every single thing, but just putting your name out there and, and having people be able to recognize your face and, and know what you, what you've been doing, you know, that kind of, that really helps, I think. Yeah, That's I definitely think those so are too. My, those are my two tips, I guess. Awesome. That I wish I had known. Don't type paragraphs and ask for more money. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, we really appreciate you uh, hanging out with us today and uh, giving us part of your afternoon. No problem. I, Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I feel, I feel honored. Well, you're, you're like kicked this thing off for us. All right, so for the for the rest of you all, we're going to do this again um, next week. We're going to have um, one of my uh, classmates from the University of New Mexico is going to join us. Her name is Kate Linzer, and uh, she works for a company called Unique Places. And uh, she's sort of the exact opposite of Paul's situation, where she is a one-person GIS department that works with a bunch of clients and works with her uh, company. So you'll kind of get two different, very different. Um, roles within this GIS environment this way. So Paul, you're welcome to join us if you want to. Sounds, sounds interesting. I like it. All right. Well, if that does it from everybody, uh, everybody have a great rest of your afternoon and thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us from Prague. Of course. <laughs> All right, y'all take it easy. Thanks. Sure thing.